everyone. This is your friendly neighborhood beer chick, Ginny of the Creek, here to give you a tutorial and a lesson on how to shuck oysters, as well as how to pair them with amazing beers. Today's episode, we are going full raw. I'm not wearing my chef jacket, not wearing any makeup, no hair, and we got raw oysters in this refrigerator over here. So here's what we're gonna do. <clears throat> uh, I'm gonna show you, uh, I'm gonna showcase four different oyster types as well as four different beers that I have selected from one of my all time favorite beer companies, Oscar Blues Brewing Company. I know you've seen their products, they're very famous for their pale ale and their good night and their old chub and their Pilsner, and um, they are a company that is based out of Colorado. I, I hope to get an interview with them one day, and I just can't say enough good things about their products. So I grabbed quite a few of them, and today we are going to get down and dirty and raw with some raw oysters. I'm gonna teach you about some oysters. I'm gonna show you how to shuck them. I'm gonna show you some creative recipes that I personally have not seen on anyone else's menu. They all came from right here. I think they're gonna be pretty good. I think you're gonna like them. So let's get into it. First, we're gonna start with the prep. We're gonna do everything all at once, just so it's a little bit faster later. Okay guys, so like I said, we're doing four recipes. The first one is going to be an oyster shot. And we're gonna make it spicy. The second one is going to be just a regular raw oyster. The third one is going to be an oyster Rockefeller. And the fourth one is going to be a fried oyster. So I have several items here that I am going to be using. So I'm just gonna chop everything up real quick so you can see how I, how I work. And then uh, we'll move on from there. There's my Parmesan from my Rockefeller have my spinach for my Rockefeller and I am going to fine chop that so that I'm going to fine chop that as well as the parsley that I have for it. Now you can use frozen spinach and then drain it and squeeze it but I like to use raw spinach because I feel like it's going to cook in the oven. I don't necessarily need to saute it first but I do have to chop it really fine so that it does break down in the heat um, and it can, the water can be released and then we can just get that all bubbled up in that delicious baked oyster that is going to result from this. Sorry, I'm moving the camera. It's shaking everything. <laughs> Looks like an earthquake. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, really, really fine. Okay. <clears throat> also, for my Rockefeller, I grabbed a Kaiser roll. You can use any type of bread that you want, but you need to basically make bread crumbs. And panko actually works the best, but I decided to try something a little different. So I got a Kaiser roll and it's an Asiago cheese Kaiser roll. So I'm gonna cut that in half here, make a nice thin slice there. I'm gonna put that in the toaster so it can get hard and then I'm gonna chop it. Here for our raw oyster, I have actual horseradish root. Can you see that? Actual horseradish root. So I'm going to grate that. You want to use the fine side of your grater. If you're a professional, you should have a microplane, but since I'm at home, all my gears at work, we're going to grate that. But make sure that you do not, do not serve this to your guests without telling them what it is first. 
because it looks almost exactly like Parmesan. And many people have made the mistakes in many restaurants of thinking that this is Parmesan when in fact it is raw, fresh horseradish. Oh, it smells so good, it's so strong. If you're ever sick, this will clear up your sinuses. <laughs> also for the Rockefellers, I have parsley. I'll put the, uh, I'll put it in its raw and chopped form so you guys can check it out. Keep a couple of leaves to the side for garnish. I'm gonna do a fine dice on this parsley. Not too much stems though, okay? Make sure you get rid of those. I'm gonna have to put this camera somewhere else. It's shaking too much. I like to fine chop this because I'm fancy. But you can coarse chop it too because it will break down inside the oyster. Like I said, as the water comes out of the spinach, it'll, there'll be a small kind of boiling effect inside the oyster shell, so this will break down anyway. But why, why risk it and just do a thing right the first time and you don't have to worry about it later. There's a saying in the kitchen, do it right or do it twice. I say just do it right. And then we have shallots too. That is going to be for our mignonette sauce. I usually like to take off the first one or two layers. Obviously you have to take off the the shell there or the skin, but I also like to take off, like I said, that first layer inside. Sometimes when your shallots aren't super fresh and sometimes they don't deliver them super fresh, you know, you just gotta be a little extra careful. I like to be rustic, but I don't like to be that rustic. <laughs> Not to the point where I'm serving food that's too soft. All right, now I'm going to rinse my knife real quick. I'm going to clean my little chopping space because <laughs> I don't want any parsley in my mignonette sauce. Here we go. You want to get the dice as absolutely teeny tiny, microscopic small as you can get. So I'm running a lot of lines in here. focus there. Should I get closer or further away? <laughs> but you can see, come on, come on, come on. Focus, focus, focus. You could see that they're very small. I hope you can see that. I hope you can tell. Teeny, 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 tiny. It should be almost minced. But the reason that we don't technically mince it is because we don't want the water releasing 
from the shallot. We want that shallot to stay solid so that it has that crunch in it to counterbalance the creaminess of an oyster. A traditional mignonette is going to use champagne vinegar, black pepper, and shallots. Today, we're going to do something a little different. I'm actually going to use a pilsner as the base for my mignonette sauce. And I have a little bit of apple cider vinegar to go with it, give it some sweeter flavor, kind of balance that out. Okay, guys. Now I'm gonna teach you how to shuck an oyster. Oh wait, forgot about my bread. All right, so here's my Asiago cheese bread and I'm gonna chop that up. Teeny tiny. Easily, you can like totally put it in a blender. Be just fine too. But it's a small piece of bread if I was making the base for the Rockefeller for 300 people. Obviously, I would want to be more effective, but right now it doesn't matter. Hey, girl. That's the little, that's my roommate's dog. I'm calling Gert. I don't really know his real name. as small as possible. like to apologize to everyone right now for how ugly my hands are. Like I said though, we're keeping it raw today. Now for the fun part, the actual oyster shucking. All right, now here's the best part here. I have a few varieties of oysters here that I wanted to show you. These are cushy oysters. These are the Royal Miyagi's. And these are the Shigokus. And I also had a frozen jar of oysters that I am going to incorporate into the podcast today just because I need to show you guys what you can do if this is all you can get. Some of you might not be able to get fresh, fresh oysters, at least not at a good, nice wholesale price. So we're going to use these for my last dish and it's going to be fun. It's still going to be delicious, okay? Okay. <clears throat> well, first thing about oysters, first thing you need is you need a clean towel, okay? I like to fold it in half and then fold it in half again. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to roll it, roll it, roll it. we get to about there. Okay. This is what a proper and effective oyster shucker looks like. Okay, it's got to have that nice teeny tiny little curve at the tip. That's what he said. 
<laughs> and a uh, nice thick handle. There are other types of oyster shuckers, but this is the best one. Okay, so go out and get this one. That's the one you want. You can find this in any, um, you can find this at Sur La Table, you can find it in Williams Sonoma, or you can just go to a restaurant supply store and you'll find it there. All right, so for the first one, which is going to be our oyster shot, I have decided to use the Shigoku's because I feel like out of all the oysters, these little guys here are the least briny. And I felt like the less salt that you have in a cocktail, uh, the better. And then I'm gonna be adding some other little savory things to it. And it's gonna be really delicious. And we are going to use a great beer to pair with that. Let me go get it. And this is one of my favorites. This is the Oscar Blues Pale Ale. I actually gave these out as Christmas presents. And hold on, let me get another stream going here. This is what we're gonna use as the base for our oyster shop. Okay, so here's our little oyster. Always wash your oysters first too, because a lot of dirt is going to come off of them, especially if you are um, in a professional setting, make sure that your employees are washing the oysters. One of my biggest pet peeves in the business is tasting dirt in seafood. It's not necessary. It only takes five minutes to wash your oysters in cold water. You'll see a lot of dirt come off from the bottom. And you have to remember, if you own a business, if you're an executive chef or an owner, your customers are going to taste that and it's going to ruin the oyster experience. And these items are way too expensive for you to be wasting them and having people send anything back. We're gonna talk a little bit more about dirt uh, when we get into the uh, uh, Miyagi's here, and then we will go from there. <clears throat> All right, so got your towel. Now, this is what I've found to be the safest way to shuck an oyster. Um, you can wear a glove, so just to show you what it looks like. If you need to wear a cut glove, this is how you wear one. Put on a plastic glove first. A cut glove goes on, on top of that. So you might want to, if you have new employees who are, haven't worked an oyster bar before for the first week or two, you might want to let them use this. Okay. And then we're going to put another glove on top of that. I don't need them at this point, but I just want to show you guys the best way to keep your cut gloves clean. All right. Oyster goes here. All right. You're going to fold the uh, belly part of your oyster into the fabric and you're going to leave this little tip hanging out. I'm going to cover my keyboard here so I don't get any oyster juice on my computer. Now the thing about this curved tip here is that you're going to place that into that little dip there. And oftentimes it will break a little bit and I prefer to just go ahead and break it so that I can get in there to this little sweet spot right here, okay? So you wanna break off that little piece of shell that was there. We're gonna get in here. We're gonna wiggle. We're gonna wiggle left and right. Wiggle side to side until I feel like I've gotten in there. God, this is gonna get raw. I told you it was gonna get raw. <laughs> and then once I found that little sweet spot, once I've dug in there, maybe a half inch or not a half inch, maybe a quarter inch, an eighth of an inch, I'll know it because I'll hear it. And once I hear it, 
almost like a lever. I'm gonna pop it down. Okay, sometimes it works, sometimes it'll pop straight up. Sometimes you'll dig into the oyster like I did just a little bit, but that's okay. Pull out my knife, I like to wipe it again because there's dirt around the outside here. And like I said, I wanna minimize the amount of dirt that the customer is gonna get or that the guest is going to get. Come in here, lift it up gently. Don't wanna break the belly. And here, see? Now there's the little, what I call the umbilical cord. Just slide right through that. Little bit of dirt on my knife here, so I'm gonna take that off. Now, that's what we want. This is very important. Like I said, getting dirt in an oyster and serving that to a customer is one of my biggest pet peeves. So I always take my finger, my pinky finger, always have clean hands, of course, and I like to kind of lift and feel around the edge, feel around the surface to make sure that there's no dirt, no mud. Come back in, break the belly. I mean, don't break the belly, break the little umbilical cord there. Turn your oyster over so that the creamy side is up. And now this little baby is ready to be served. I'm gonna put this on ice until until I'm ready to shoot it. Now, for the shot itself. I'm gonna use a little bit of Creole seasoning. Grab some hot sauce as well. If you can find uh, some Clamato or some tomato sauce, you want to put that in there. I don't have it. <clears throat> I don't have that right now. It's the one thing that I forgot from the store, and I'm still going to do this shot anyway. Grab some lemon. I don't quite have a shot glass that's small enough because I don't really drink a lot of hard liquor. I'm going to start with throwing a little Cajun seasoning in the bottom. Little hot sauce. Little lemon juice. So it's almost like we're starting a Michelada here. We're starting a Bloody Mary. With, with all of the brine, with all of the brine, we are gonna go ahead and pop that in there. Let that sit for a second. And now I'm going to open my Dale's Pale Ale, beer that I absolutely love. And we're gonna cover the oyster and the little sweet mixture, I mean the hot mixture, about halfway up. Let that sit for a second. And we're gonna give it a try. Mm. So here we have our first item. That is our oyster shot with Dale's Pale Ale. All right. Oh, I could just drink the liquid. Love it. Ooh. Mmm. The flavor of that oyster is so neutral. Oh, it's coming in in the uh, aftertaste. The flavor with that oyster is so neutral that it really allows the hops from the beer to come forward. Now this isn't a super hoppy beer. It says that it's voluminous, voluminously hopped pale ale but it really doesn't taste too hoppy. But when you combine it with the oysters, it really comes out in the aftertaste and everything just flows really well together. This is something that you can serve at your restaurant with a little Bloody Mary mix or Michelada mix. Um, 
You can even make a Japanese oyster shot by doing the same thing, but instead of using a pale ale, you can use a Japanese beer, or you can use sake and a little bit of ponzu to give it a, a more Asian flavor. It's a lot of fun there. So next, let's get into this mignonette sauce that I'm really, really excited to make. A traditional minion, mignonette sauce is going to be champagne vinegar, shallots, and black pepper. Some chefs prefer to use black pepper, some do not. I think the right way to do it is to add the black pepper. I think it needs it, something to balance out. I caught your hair. <laughs> there ain't no hair. My hair's tied up, honey. Um, the best way to do it is to add the black pepper because it needs it to kind of balance out the salty brininess of the oyster and it just creates more savory flavors. But instead of using traditional champagne vinegar, I'm going to use another one of my favorite beers from Oscar Blues. Now, if you've been listening to my show, you know that I am a Pilsner girl. I love my Pilsners, my lagers, my ales, my Belgian wheats, my Oktoberfest, and um, I just, I love a light beer. So I've picked this one, and this is really one of the best Pilsners that's on the market. I'm kind of sad that I bought such a big can and can't totally finish it before <laughs> work today, <laughs> but I'll try to finish it. I don't want this beautiful Pilsner to go to waste, so I'm uh, actually going to taste it. Look at that color. This is honestly one of the best pills on the market. Cheers, everyone. I'm telling you, this company... Oscar Blues, everything they touch, everything they create is fantastic. So a little bit more for the chef and then we'll make the sauce. All right, got a clean bowl here. I'm not married, honor kill, I'm single. <laughs> here we go. So here's my shallots. There's my pills, and then I've got apple cider vinegar there, black pepper. I'm not gonna make that much, obviously. If you're doing this at a restaurant, you're gonna wanna um, make at least a quart or two for every service that you have. Make sure there's enough black pepper to where you can see it. This is one of those sauces, there's really no right or wrong way to do it. You just wanna make sure that all the ingredients are in there. Just add a few little drops of vinegar here, cover the bottom. I add another little squeeze of lemon juice here. And now for the pills in her. And we want to go about five to one. So if you're going to put a tablespoon of apple cider vinegar, you want to put five tablespoons of Pilsner. If you want to put a cup of apple cider vinegar, you want to put five cups of Pilsner. If you are a very, very active and busy seafood restaurant and you have a dollar oyster happy hour and you sell a lot of oysters, probably want to go a gallon apple cider vinegar to five gallons of beer. Okay, so just about five to one. Oh yeah. I'm going to let the bubbles, carbonation, just kind of fizz out of that for a second. I'm gonna set that to the side. I'll pour a little bit more. I can't eat, eat. There's, 
there aren't too many companies that can beat this. Okay, everyone's into Scrimshaw, and I love North Coast, but I don't think Scrimshaw is that good. Everyone's into Trumer Pills out here in the Bay Area. I personally don't like Trumer Pills at all. I think it's a weak tasting beer. It's like Bud Light. But this baby right here, this is, it's dry, it's crisp. It has this almost, <clears throat> I don't know how to explain it. It has almost a, a creamy like flavor to it. Almost as if there's some sort of a, like there's a little bit more malt in there, like a sweet kind of a soda malt, almost like a Sprite or, I don't know. I don't know how to explain it, but it is one of the best on the market. If you see this brand, if you see this can, anything they make, you're going to enjoy it. All right. So for this oyster, I have just, for this beer, I have decided to pair it with the Cushies. Now, because the beer, like I said, is rather creamy and sweet, even though it is crisp and really clean and astringent the way a Pilsner is supposed to taste, there is something else in that beer that has so much flavor. It's a little bit almost juicy. It's almost like drinking a juicy IPA. If you've had a juicy IPA, this would be the equivalent of a juicy Pilsner. So because of that, I wanted to make sure I, I grabbed the saltiest oyster of the bunch, and that would be the Cushy. This one has the most brine. It has the most natural flavor of the sea. And let me bring you a little bit closer so you can get a side view of how this is done. Here, okay. Oh, yeah. I like close-ups. Those slips are awesome. <laughs> so once again, I'm going to break, let me pull you back a little bit. I'm going to break that little bit of shell there. I'm going to wiggle my tool in here until I hear the little suction. It's almost like a little suction. You'll hear the air come up. And I just heard it. So now I'm going to lift up. Pop. Beautiful. Lift that baby up. I like to wipe my knife. This is another thing. If you are an oyster, I mean, I'm sorry, if you are an owner or an executive chef, you need to get your staff in the business of wiping their knives. Because all the dirt from all the oysters that they're going to be shucking is going to come onto this knife. I wipe my knife constantly. Use as many towels as you need to fucking use to make sure that you're serving your customer clean tasting oysters. Now, come in through here. You can see the little belly button on the local cord. Wiping my knife again because I got a little more dirt on it. Cut straight through. Boom. Done. Once again, I take my little finger. Oh, don't want to lose that brine. And that leads me back to cleaning it again. Make sure that your employees do not get lazy. Don't let them just turn the oyster over and dump all everything out thinking that the, the dirt is going to come out because it won't. The shells are not gonna come out. You need to literally run your finger around the side and anything that's gonna come up is gonna come up on your finger, but don't turn this oyster over. I've seen a lot of really lazy line cooks do that and it drives me crazy. Come underneath the oyster, break the umbilical cord, pop it over so that pretty belly is showing, and there we go. <clears throat> Ooh, I'm excited to try this mignonette sauce. Just gonna cover that. And now we're gonna shoot it. Mmm. Oh. oh my God. Now that is gonna keep your customers coming back. 
and they're not just going to come back for happy hour. They're going to be coming back and spending the full amount that you need them to spend. And you guys are going to make a lot of money with that one. That was that Pilsner Mignonette. That stuff is killer. Delicious. Fact. Ooh. And then that black pepper at the end pulls everything together. Rinse it back down with some more Pilsner. It's one of the best things I've ever tasted. Thank you, Oscar Blues. And thank you, Cushies. Oh my God, that's so good. Now for the Oyster Rockefeller, what you wanna do is you wanna choose either an East Coast oyster because that's generally what we're used to. No, I didn't get a bad oyster. <laughs> and speaking of getting bad oysters, always make sure that your staff is trained to know when they're smelling one. I mean, you'll know when you pop it open because it'll just, the smell will just come up into your nose. You're not going to need to figure out that it stinks. But just make sure that you are employing people who care enough to not be so eager to get through all those tickets that they serve something that's bad. Have I seen it happen before? Yeah. Does it happen often? No. But when you're paying people minimum wage, they tend not to give a shit. And it's your Yelp reviews that are going to suffer. It's your reputation that's going to suffer. So make sure, make sure that they understand a little, you know, smelling your, smelling the oysters as you go is very important. Wiping that knife as you, is very important. Now with these type of oysters, you'll notice that the edge of them, they're super, super um, flaky. And this shell here is so delicate, I can break it with my, my fingers, okay? This shell, um, you'll see this on the fanny bays as well. They're so, the shells are so delicate. So this oyster takes a little longer to prep and I'm gonna show you how. Remember what I talked about being clean and keeping dirt out of the food? This edge of my towel is a little bit wet. So I'm gonna go ahead, turn it the other way, fold it, roll it the other way, so that now I'm using this nice clean area on the other side of the towel. And you can continue to fold your towel until it's dry and clean and you can't use it anymore. Make sure your employees understand that. And you as an owner or an executive chef, you need to make sure that you're ordering laundry. Because trust me, I've been in places where the laundry wasn't ordered and we had to hand wash towels and we all had to, you know, uh, dry them in the oven. It's ridiculous. Just don't be an asshole. Order enough towels for your staff. It'll make a big difference in the morale of your business and the efficiency of your business. All right, guys, let's get into it. All right, here we go. Come in here, wiggle, 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 wiggle. Oh, that's okay. And you know what? I slipped, but that's all right because, oh, shit. I slipped, but that's okay because I have the cut glove. And I also am old enough and experienced enough in this business to know when to move my hand. Oh, there's that sweet spot. I hear it. I hear the vacuum. Now let's lift this baby up. There we go. Oh, look at that. Now, sometimes it gets more complicated. Um, with this oyster, like I said, the shells are so fragile that they just break. They break, they break, they break, they break. This is an oyster, not so much with the cushies and the shigokus. I'm sorry, the cushies and the, um, yeah, the cushies, the shigokus, East Coast oysters, New, Brun New Brunswick oysters, Maine oysters. Their shells are more different. They're sh they're, the, the oysters are tumbled, so they don't get this flaky shell. Um, oysters that haven't been tumbled will get this flaky shell here. And this is the stuff that breaks. So this is when, you, once again, you really wanna go in there with your finger and I'm pulling out pieces of shell just right now, just, just now. 
Okay, come in, kind of line it up. See, look at all that. Do you want your customers to eat that? Do you want that to ruin their experience, their dining experience, and have them not come back because they've got a mouthful of shells? I don't. I want the customers to come back every happy hour. And then I want them to come back when it's not happy hour and still pay full price. See that? Okay. Just get that shell out. And sometimes there'll be dirt too. So this is another opportunity, not just to remove the shell, but to remove the dirt. All right. So this looks pretty good. I don't see anything there that is going to bother me. Come back underneath. Cut the belly, boom, turn that baby over. Mm, 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 mm. All right, so now, now we gotta make the Rockefeller portion of it. So I'm gonna start with uh, my spinach. Throw my spinach on there. Remember, it was fine chopped. I'm going to throw just a tiny, teeny little bit of garlic in there. Now, you can pre mix the garlic and the spinach together. Um, I don't want too much garlic in there because I think it will overpower the oyster, and that's something we don't want to do. Okay. And now, my Parmesan, oh yeah, my Parmesan. I like to put the Parmesan down because it will dry and I wanna make sure my cheese gets in there. And then my breadcrumbs. I'll just pack it in there just a little bit. And then top it with my chopped parsley. Now, the fun thing about doing oysters Rockefeller is that the ingredients are cheap and you can make them pretty much on anything, anywhere. So I'm gonna put them in the oven because that's what I have, but I've actually done smoked oysters Rockefeller. I've done uh, wood grilled oysters Rockefeller. I've done charcoal grilled oysters Rockefeller. Um, you can make oysters Rockefeller in a teeny tiny apartment. If you have a toaster oven, you can make it in a toaster oven. It's just as awesome. Pan. No, I'm gonna make one for my roommate. <laughs> Oops. Wiggle, 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 lift. Break through. Oh, that's a big one. Nice. Check for shells. Check for dirt. Check for mud. Check for stink. <laughs> Turn that belly over and then hook that baby up. While that is in the oven, I'm going to clean up here and we're going to prep for the fried oyster. It's going to be a little bit more intense, a little bit more labor intensive, but it's going to be delicious. 
I remember I said that if you can't get fresh oysters, um, I got a jar of oysters for you. Um, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not totally opposed to using frozen products in the kitchen because if it's a good frozen product, it's just worth the time. Now, if you're doing something cheap like an oyster po' boy or you're just doing fried oysters as an appetizer, there's no point in using the more higher end oysters. There really isn't. And let me tell you what I like about jarred oysters is because they're left in this beautiful brine here and they're generally very soft and creamy. I mean, all oysters are soft and creamy, but these ones tend to have really, really full bellies from absorbing all the liquid and they tend to be really, really delicious. So I've never had a problem with frozen oysters, jarred oysters. If you need to use it, just use it and make everything else taste delicious. Yeah, <clears throat> I'm going to take out a couple, but I don't want to remove the brine. I'm going to keep that brine for a rainy day. About two. Look how big they are. I mean, who wouldn't want to? Who wouldn't want to eat that? You know, delicious. my oysters here. Now for this one, I'm going to be using a Dale's, um, I'm sorry, an Oscar Blues product that's a little bit more expensive and you might not be able to find it in every place that you go look for it, okay? I'm going to be using the 1050 Imperial Stout Barrel Aged. Now, the price point between this one and the one that's not barreled age is about $10. So this can by itself in San Francisco was $16.99. I almost don't want to waste it. <laughs> I almost don't want to waste it, but uh, we're going to go ahead and use it anyway. The reason that I chose this is because I want to do a play on fish and chips with oysters. And oftentimes you will see a beer battered fish and chips. So that's what we're gonna make. We're gonna make a beer batter for it. Um, I'm actually even gonna start by throwing a little of this on there, throwing a little of this on the oysters to kind of give them some flavor while we wait for the Rockefellers to cook. And while I finish prepping this, I'm gonna give this guy a taste here. Oh, it's like candy. Very sweet. Uh, definitely the bourbon flavor is coming out very, very strong. So this is going to be kind of a Cajun inspired, beer batter inspired, or a Cajun inspired oyster a little bit. The reason that I chose this super thick, super dark stout for this dish is because I prefer um, Guinness battered fish to lager battered fish. So that's why I'm gonna go ahead and use the really, really strong flavors. But you can always make the same batter with a lager or any other type of beer. A Hefeweizen would work great. Uh, any kind of ale would work great. But if you want that strong flavor, um, you can make a killer, Keller beer batter with a stout. And if you ha don't have a lot of money, go ahead and buy the Guinness. It'll work. Trust me, when it cooks, the flavor does come through. Um, but I wanted to showcase what Oscar can do and how much I love Oscar. This is so good. Oh my God. This is like drinking Coca Cola with whiskey. It's delicious. A little more for the show. So much sweetness at the end. So we're gonna need a lot of salt to cut through that. 
So to make our beer bag, flour, AP flour. Make sure you don't use cake flour. I've seen it happen. baking powder. And to try to keep it a little Cajun, I'm going to add some cornstarch just to give it that crunch. Normally with a beer batter, you want to go 50 <laughs> oh shit, that made it worse. <laughs> I don't care. Normally with a beer batter, you want to go 50-50. I'm going to go um, about 70-30 in my mix here. Gonna, I still have my Cajun seasoning from earlier. See, I mean, we've got oysters and bourbon. I mean, it, it should be Cajun, you know, but we're doing a Japanese technique. It'll be fun. It's going to come out good. <clears throat> I'm going to add a bit of my, remember I made this horseradish? Throw some of that in there. And salt and pepper. I like sea salt or kosher salt. No iodized salt ever, not with my cooking. Certainly not with professional cooking either. Shouldn't have it in there. Shouldn't have it in your kitchen. Oops, some popped in there. I think I'm going to save this batter and have oysters all week. <laughs> oh, look at that. Look at that. Might have made a little bit too much, but that's okay. Let's get our pen out. You want kind of the consistency of cake batter, but a little bit, maybe a little bit thinner than that. But it should almost be like cake batter. As you can see, the color is not the most appetizing. It actually looks like chocolate cake. So this is why I think normally you would use a lager or a and something lighter. Test whether or not your oil is hot enough. You just want to get either some flour or just a little bit of batter and it does not appear that they are bubbling up as quickly as I would like to. They are bubbling up though but just not quite as quickly as I would like. Therefore, I'm going to let that oil get a little bit hotter. Mess. I told you we were going raw. Fresh oysters, fresh face, fresh laundry. Check back on these rockefellers. You want to let the rockefellers cook until they are bubbling and crispy and crunchy and like juicy around the side. Everything should look dry. The parsley should be cooked down, the spinach should be cooked down, but it should look, it should appear to be 
bubbling around the edge, almost like a, uh, like you want a, ma a baked macaroni and cheese. You want that bubbling around the edge, a casserole, you want it bubbling around the edge. That's what you want to see here. Turn up the heat there. All right, so now the oil's really getting hot and uh, Now, normally I should have let these sit like overnight in the beer, the oysters, but I didn't. It's okay. It's okay. Get your little paper towel ready and make sure you have a slotted spoon. Or if you're doing a lot of these, make sure you have a big spider so you can pull them all out. You don't want these guys to overcook. You just want them to cook just enough to be crispy and golden on the outside. All right, guys, let's get into it. Oh, yeah. Mm. I don't have a whole lot of oil in the uh, pot there, so I'm gonna make sure that I flip it so everything cooks evenly. All right, guys, I made a little professional amateur mistake here. There wasn't enough oil in here, so they actually stuck. And I'm gonna take them out and try it again. I'm gonna add more oil. I can just smell that batter. It just smells incredible. Add some more oil in there. He's coconut oil at home. In the workplace, it's usually canola or some sort of blend or fry, just regular fryer oil. And at home, I like to eat. Rockefellers, you're looking good, but they're not quite cooked yet. Um, you want to cook them on high heat. So 400 degrees, 450 degrees is good. At home, I go lower because I like to make sure that I don't burn things because I tend to get distracted at home, not at work, but at home I do. But let me up the temperature on here. I add a little bit more flour to the batter because it didn't quite coat the way I wanted it to. When you make mistakes, you just keep going until you fix them. And the thing about food, unless it's baking, if it's savory food, you can almost fix anything. <laughs> I hear the grease popping, huh? Oh, this is so good. Even the fucked up ones, 
taste amazing. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Oscar Blues. Yeah, bourbon. You can hold beer butter for about two days too. So don't think because I made too much that this isn't gonna get used. It's gonna, it's gonna. to fix my batter and the Rockefellers are in the oven. They're looking good. Um, I needed to add a little bit more uh, flour because it was a little too thin. And like I said, just like cake batter and tiny bit more watery than that, okay? I added more oil to my, uh, added more oil to the pot. Back even add a little bit more just so I don't fuck it up in front of you. <laughs> I actually, it's weird when you. It's weird when you cook in huge kitchens and then you come home and try to cook for yourself. It's, I don't know, like my my brain can't like process it. You know, I'm used to having big fryers. I'm not used to using little, little pots. That's not to say I didn't learn how when I was, before I became a chef, but it's just, I don't know, it's just different now. Like you get used to doing it on large scales and you don't really know how to cook for one or two. <laughs> All right, so uh, oysters. Imperial Stout, Barrel Aged Imperial Stout. Get them really coated. And like I said, this beer batter can hold for at least one day. So I'm gonna be eating beer battered everything for the next two days. And, uh, cause I don't wanna waste this. Like I said, that was a, six, a $17 bottle of beer and I'm not just gonna waste it. So this is delicious beer batter. I don't wanna fuck it up. Put some gloves on because I just touched my face. Make sure that your staff is doing that. Do not let your staff get away with poor hygiene in the kitchen. It's gonna drive me crazy. It's gonna drive you crazy. Make sure that they're not touching their cell phones, touching their face, touching their lips, touching their hair. Okay, so we got the oysters in there. We're gonna check to see. Oh yeah. And you want that to fizzle up like a funnel cake. Fizzle, fizzle, fizzle. That black stuff you see at the bottom was because I made the mistake before of not having enough oil in there and the oyster stuck and it burnt but that's okay. Um, I'm not gonna scrape that now because I don't want it to get into what I'm cooking, but I will scrape it later and then strain the oil so that I can use the oil again. Okay? That's another one of my pet peeves in the kitchen. Don't let your employees scrape the pan. If it's burnt at the bottom, leave it burnt. Pour everything out then scrape it off. 
don't scrape burnt shit back into your food, back into your soup, back into whatever you're frying. I hate that. It drives me nuts. Just let it sit there burnt until you're ready to clean it. Now we've got a nice better fry here. I think this is gonna be a little bit better. Look at that. Oh, yeah. That's what I'm talking about. Look how dark that is. Beautiful. I love beer batter. Do you? Beer batter is everything. Oh, 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 shit. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. It smells so good. It smells so good. Um, I'm about to pull them out. I'm going to uh, finish them with a little bit more of that Creo seasoning that I had. Remember from the oyster shot? I'm going to use some of that. Um, and some salt. Oh yeah, these bad boys are ready. When you drop something on the floor, back in the fryer for 10 seconds. It'll kill off any germs that might have uh, gotten on there, but the floors in my house are really clean. Obviously in a restaurant, I wouldn't do that. But at home, you know how clean your floors are. If your floors are five second real clean, drop it back in. In the, in the restaurant, no. Because you don't know who you're working with or what's on the bottom of their shoes. <laughs> Remember guys, we always season as soon as the food comes up. A little sprinkle of uh, salt, a little sprinkle of Cajun, and I'm going to throw some of the horseradish. Remember I put the horseradish in the beer batter? I throw a little on top just for that extra spice. Oh my god, I'm so excited. <sighs> Look at that. Look at that beautiful bourbon stout beer batter from Oscar Blues. Absolutely smells amazing. I know it's going to taste great because I have already, let me throw a little lemon too. I know it's going to taste good because I've already had the fucked up version and the fucked up version was delicious. Give that a second to cool before I taste it. Check on my rocket focus. Y'all don't even know. You don't even know. Remember I said we want it to bubble around the edges? 
Okay, it was starting to bubble in the back. I don't know if you can quite see that. I'm gonna pop it back in just for another minute to keep it hot and to keep it bubbling. Four hundred and fifty degrees. Let's get into this one. Amazing. So delicious. So malty, earthy. This is how you bring the turf to the surf. This is how you do it right here. This stout, I taste everything. It's, it's unbelievable. This is so good. Mm. I'm going to tell you one thing, though, about oysters. Some people will serve them with cocktail sauce. That's how babies eat oysters. Grown-ups, you don't want anything with too much tomato to overpower the oyster. So what I would say for this, for these, I would definitely use this on a po' boy sandwich, but make sure that you're using like a garlic remoulade or red pepper remoulade or garlic aioli or something like that. Don't slather it with cocktail sauce because the cocktail sauce will take over everything that we just worked our asses off to create. This type of oyster, all it needs is either some lemon or some mignonette or, or a, a drop of hot sauce. Do not put cocktail sauce on this. It's too good. It's too good. The beer batter is too good to ruin it. Mm. Beautiful little Rockefeller here. Don't do that at home. <laughs> you guys see, I, I have to apologize for being a woman with ugly hands, but it's just years in the industry. As you can see, I have nothing but scars and burns and cuts everywhere. That's why I'm getting tattoos to cover them up. <laughs> I never wanted sleeves, but I have to get them now because my skin is so fucked up. But whatever. Anyway, let's get into this Rockefeller. And to pair with the Rockefeller, what I have chosen is something very hoity-toity. It's probably the most hoity-toity beer that Oscar Blues makes. Let me show it to you. I drank one of these last night. This thing is unbelievable. This is the Oscar Blues Guns and Rosé, Rosé Ale, made with hibiscus, which is Jamaica, and prickly pear. I will have to tell you guys this. When I tell you I love this company, if this company was a man, I would want to marry it. This company makes the most delicious, crisp, complex flavors of beer that I think any company can do. And not all companies will be able to make products that are all spot on, but I've never tasted anything from this company that I did not think was above average and beyond expectations, beyond expectations. Every time I open one of these Oscar Blues cans, I am reminded of why I like to drink beer. So this is the Guns N' Rosé. Felt like it was kind of a, you know, <laughs> upper class type of beer to serve with the Oyster Rockefeller. So let me get another glass here. Let's get into it. Oh, look at the color. Look at that color. Let the head uh, sit for a second. 
I'll have another one of these. So good. Actually, you know what? I'm going to grab some of that mignonette that I made earlier, the Pilsner mignonette. Throw that on here. Unbelievable. The thing I like about this Guns N' Roses it, Rose, really juicy. And the thing about hibiscus or hamica is it almost tastes like cranberry juice. Even though it's a flower and not a fruit, it has this very, very clean, astringent flavor as cranberry juice does. Like you drink it and you feel like you're cleaning yourself out. That's what hibiscus is. Um, you can find hibiscus, if you don't know what it is, it also goes under the name Hamaica. Hamaica is a drink that you can very, very easily find at any Mex Mexican restaurant that sells agua fresca. So if they're selling horchata and ole, they're probably selling the Hamaica as well. So you can taste it in its pure form as a tea, and then now you get to taste it in a beer. And I don't know anyone else who's putting Hamaica in their beer. Only Oscar Blues, as far as I know. Mm. It's even better with that Pilsner mignonette. Good Lord. I need to get a boyfriend. <laughs> this is overwhelming. I don't know if it's the oysters or the beer. Awesome. But anyway, let's get into this. It's piping hot oyster Rockefeller. Beautiful. Mm. What you want to do is kind of come down from the sides with your fork so you don't lose any of the cheese or the breadcrumbs. Like I said, you want it to cook till it's boiling around the edges. Everything should be melted. <sighs> this episode, <laughs> I'm glad I'm teaching it by myself. <laughs> raw, raw, raw. the sweetness from the pear and the um, sweetness from the jamaica, hibiscus, is really, really cutting through all of the salt in the Rockefeller. So there's salt in the bread, there's salt in the Parmesan, there's salt in the oyster. This really cuts through it in a nice, clean, sweet way, balances it out, Makes you want to eat more and drink more, eat more and drink more. I would suggest the Rockefeller for any party that you're having. And it's also something that can be done ahead of time. So if you're going to someone else's house, make your Rockefellers, assemble them, wrap them in plastic so they're tight and they don't move, and then pop them in the oven when you get to the party. Grab a six pack of this Guns and Rosé. You're going to be the person that everyone talks about, you're going to be the person that everyone invites back to the parties for this exact reason. If you're going to serve this in your restaurant, serve it with obviously either a rosé, a real rosé. If you can find the Guns and Roses on tap, go ahead and serve it with that. Otherwise, any other kind of Kolsch or Pilsner will, will work really, really well. Oh, excuse me will work really, really well to cut through that salt. And it's, it's absolutely delicious. 
I, not to brag or anything, but I'm really proud of myself. I think that what I'm doing here, nobody else is doing. And I work in like one of, one of the restaurant capitals of the world. I have not seen what I'm doing on anyone else's menu. So I'm really proud of these recipes. I hope that you enjoyed them as well. I hope that this beer cam episode encourages you to follow me on YouTube. I am Beer Talk Radio on YouTube, as you can see. Please make sure that you subscribe so you can get more cool review videos and cooking videos. I would like to thank all of my new subscribers on YouTube. Thank you guys for stepping up. Thank you guys for enjoying the show and being a part of it. And I would also like to thank Chef Ming Wang, who was in one of my first early episodes of Beer Talk Radio doing Beer Pairing 101. This is Beer Pairing 102 with oysters. He was kind enough to order the oysters for me so I could get them at the wholesale price. And I'm ever so grateful for that. Also, and also like to thank Oscar Blues. You guys just keep making amazing beer. And I don't know too many companies that can touch you. I really don't. I think because I wasn't able to get a full line of Oscar Blues products today, what I wanna do is maybe do another beer pairing episode where I can use some of their other products that I love. One of which they have an uh, they have an Imperial Red. They have um, they have another Imperial Stout. They've got a couple of IPAs, which I don't drink, but maybe I can cook with them. And they've also got a couple. Uh, they've got a Scottish ale that I really really wanted to incorporate. They've got a coconut ale that I really wanted to incorporate, but maybe I'll find um, some heartier fishes. Like we'll do an, uh, a beer and fish episode maybe, and I can use some of the stronger beers, some of their darker products into that episode and just keep educating you about this amazing company, Oscar Blues. I have been drinking your beers for probably about 10 years now. I love your company. Keep doing what you're doing. I hope that you guys learn something. I hope that it gets you in the kitchen and it gets you encouraged to cook at a master chef level. And if you are a chef, if you are an executive chef, or if you are an owner of a restaurant, I hope that this encourages you to push your creativity a little bit further and get people loving craft beer and loving oysters. And on that note, I'm going to finish this last oyster that I got here. So y'all have a great one.